all who are joining us. And um, uh, I, it's my pleasure. I'm Laura Bartolo from Northwestern, and uh, I am one of the co-hosts for, for today's session. Um, we are delighted in the materials data interest group to be um, co-hosting this with BAM. And so Birgit uh, Skrotsky and um, uh, Bjorn Mueller are uh, also co-hosts and they are joining us from BAM. Um, we'll have a full session and um, we're gonna start with a few, with three news breaks um, updates and, uh, and then move into the bulk of our meeting. And it's two panel discussions. Um, and for that, we are delighted to have Hank Burkholz, um, Masahiko Demura, um, David Elbert, and Matthew Evans, um, representing various regions in the material science community and different organizations. Um, our first panel discussion is going to be on the challenges and international collaborations for funded research projects. After that discussion, um, where the panelists will present briefly, and then we look to our entire audience to join into this discussion about the challenges and opportunities for collaboration. Our second panel discussion with the same panelists We'll then be focusing on uh, identifying real technical issues that they believe are of common interest and mutual benefit for the global material science community. And then uh, finally, um, we'll have a, a, a brief session in the back where we're hoping that there will be volunteers to host some um, a couple of remote meetings um, for people to join into so that we can prepare for um, P19. Uh, so keep that in mind as you are hearing the discussions as you are taking part and hear about issues that you would like to get involved with. In the first panel discussion, Jim and I will moderate. In the second panel discussion, Brigitte and Bjorn will moderate. So uh, thank you, and let me go ahead and get started um, by um, the first news item, and that is to um, bring out uh, the good news about a new journal that is uh, going to be launching in the beginning of December, the Materials Open Resource or Research. Um, this uh, open access publishing platform really is geared towards um, supporting transparency and reproducibility in the material science community research. Um, authors will be able to publish their research outputs um, rapidly and openly. There will be a transparent and invited post publication peer review. Um, and the journal um, strongly endorses fair data uh, principles um, alongside a strong open data policy. The, the um, editors will provide guidance to authors on making their source data openly available. And we know that this is much needed guidance. The data will be, uh, the data availability statement will be mandated for every article that is accepted by the journal data notes, and a range of other flexible article types will be made available. And then there will be in-article code and data visualization and reanalysis widgets, such as um, code oceans that will be uh, made available in the new journal. As soon as it does launch, we'll be noting that uh, with the site uh, information on the material science data interest group list. So look for that. Uh, next, I'd like to invite Jane Greenberg from uh, Drexel University, who also wanted to make a brief um, update. Jane?
So I don't hear anything from Jane, so maybe she'll join us later. Next, I'd like to invite, uh, I'll stop sharing and invite um, NIS uh, uh, members of um, Chandler Becker and um, Ray Plant to give a brief update as well. Great, thank you, Laura. So let me go ahead and share my screen. So Ray and I were asked to give a quick update on the NIST Materials Resource Registry. Uh, a few highlights to begin with. Uh, the Materials Resource Registry code is currently stable and available at GitHub. It is built on the Configurable Data Curation System so, uh, code stack and it is open source and primarily developed by the NIST Software and Systems Division. REST API and OAIPMH are supported. The vocabulary is available via the NIST Public Data Repository. The working group final report has been submitted. And currently we're focusing on building out support for search uh, and particularly uh, to enable finding data via the resource registry interface. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, I just wanna say we're happy to work with other projects and institutions. And if that is of interest to you, then please uh, get in touch with me and or Ray so that we can uh, make that happen. So for those of you who aren't familiar with this effort, uh, resources are listings of information about organizations, data collections, data sets, services like APIs, software, informational sites such as web pages, and semantic assets like vocabularies. They can be maintained locally or harvested from another registry interface or instance. And a common question is, do I have to give you my data? And the answer is no. This is about being able to find data via metadata listings. So in particular, a resource uh, can include both uh, subject-specific metadata, as well as gener more general descriptions, contact information, references, et cetera. Uh, and all of the content is available, again, via both the website and the API or metadata harvesting. So here's an example of a record. Uh, and you can see that many of those fields have been populated uh, in this case. So I mentioned that there's a web interface uh, that it looks basically like this. You can search for uh, text within records. In this case, I did a search for density functional theory, which returned uh, records both from the NIST instance, which we refer to as the NMRR, NIST Materials Resource Registry, as well as an instance that is hosted uh, at the Materials Data Facility in association with CHIMAD. The metadata is described uh, using both a controlled vocabulary and free text. Uh, you can see some examples here where we characterize things by material type and structural information, properties, processing, et cetera. Uh, and this is available, uh, as I mentioned, through the NIST Public Data Repository. If you are interested in learning more about it, uh, please contact us. And uh, this is meant to work with and be extended and link to other efforts. So uh, this is not meant to be a uh, final version that will be cast in stone. So the system is meant to be federated. And so here's an example of a diagram that uh, was adapted from one that Ray Plant at NIST created, uh, where we have multiple entities that are sharing and using the records that are in the system. And the so some uh, data centers, for example, could publish just records about their data holdings. Uh, others might operate uh, more larger scale registries that could cover things from multiple institutions. There are very wide ranges of ways that, that institutions and projects can participate in this network. And uh, so we're um, part of the key features are that it, because it is networked, it's more robust, uh, that you can exchange locally curated metadata uh, because presumably the people who maintain that data know best what it is uh, and it supports search and discovery. 
Okay, so one of the more recent uh, things that you probably haven't seen yet is that we are working to actively start integrating the materials resource registry into this larger set of uh, resources and other uh, efforts. So here's an example that um, that we created in order to show the types of things that can be done with this system. So here's an example where we might send a query to the NIST materials resource registry via the API, get results back, and then choose a resource to query further, which may be an automated process, then send the query to the chosen resource itself, get the return data and parse it and act on it. And so as an example, um, we, use the interatomic potentials and nickel and cohesive energy to ultimately get a record match for the NIST interatomic potentials repository and then send a query to the uh, interatomic potentials repository itself to get relevant calculations, including a cohesive energy for some of the potentials uh, that contain nickel and then parse that data and plot it. And then this can be a, a sort of a recurring thing. This has been implemented in a Jupyter notebook, uh, which I'd be happy to work with people to, to go into more detail, but this represents the sort of newest and newest direction and uh, the focus of current efforts. So just to summarize, the NIST Materials Resource Registry is located at https materials.registry.nist.gov. Um, and we're working on realizing this vision where an application sends a search to the registry and then users or applications get um, materials data and resources from the re resources, sorry, from the resources registered with it in a format that's compatible with what they're looking for and what they need. Um, and records are currently available via both the web interface and the API, and uh, that can be used to build and execute additional queries for data where the supporting infrastructure exists. So again, if you are interested in learning more or collaborating, uh, please talk to Ray and or me, and we'd be happy to, uh, to, to work with you. And with that, I will stop sharing. Thank you. Thanks very much, um, Chandler and Ray. Um, that was a great, concise um, presentation. Um, are there questions that people might like to ask um, Ray and Chandler? Um, I'll put that out. And also, um, hopefully you have seen on our site um, the uh, link to the collaborative notes. And we ask that you go there and to please sign in um, so that we can tell, um, so that we know who is who has attending our uh, session. So, are there any questions for um, Chandler and Ray? I don't see any. Um, and again, um, they have their information um, and we'll make sure that it's on the materials data interests group um, email list um, so that if anyone would like to, they can get in touch with them directly. At this point, I'd like to move on to the second part um, and that is the discussions and to bring Jim on to lead the discussions um, with our three panelists to introduce them and get them started. Great, thanks, Laura, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so just to be sure we're all on the same page here, um, right? So the goal, right, of this whole session today is really to try to establish some deep, deeper working collaborations amongst um, the various participants. One of the challenges we've had uh, with the RDA, uh, you know, as great as it's been for bringing together such diverse community, um, is that the plenaries are only twice a year. And, you know, so we maybe get to talk for a couple of hours. And that's really not enough time to get done what is a, a really large amount of work. But, you know, the good news is there's now a number of funded projects that are working in areas. Um, that are of direct relevance to this interest group. 
And so the idea here is really to start to get the ball rolling. Now, the funding levels uh, vary depending on the organization that we're talking about. Um, but nonetheless, uh, often um, I found in these meetings that there's a lot of very strong and enthusiastic interest in these topics, but basically people then have to go back home to their jobs. Um, and if their job isn't specifically supporting these issues, then we have problems. So um, that's that's the goal here. And as the conversations evolve, um, hopefully we'll uh, get to a place of, tr of true collaboration. Okay, so with that brief sort of call to arms, um, I guess I'm going to introduce uh, the speakers, um, and I'm looking <laughs> right now for the list of speakers. Laura, you took down your slide. Um, um, and so <laughs> Hank is first. Okay, Hank so first. thanks for helping yes. there. Um, so Hank, if you would, uh, well, actually, I guess uh, uh, Brigitte is going to uh, show your slides for you, but go ahead. Thank you. Thank you a lot. So, uh, and thank you, everybody. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, I think we're having to go to an extent also. I think we're at the right place here. So, so that's my first impression after the uh, first 50 minutes we've been here. Uh, this is the right place for us to be. <laughs> that, that is cool, I think. Uh, let's find out if that's uh, just a thesis or, uh, or some facts. So, um, uh, first of all, I'm Hank Burkholz. Um, I'm, I'm with a certain project that I'm going to. Uh, uh, present here today, that's the Material Digital Initiative uh, in Germany. Uh, in Germany means that it's kick-started in the, in the German-speaking uh, domains, um, but it's, it's supposed to be FAIR. So that's, uh, that's an acronym we know well. And, and for that, uh, we, we do not speak English, uh, German in general, but typically we do this all in English and other languages. Again, we want to be interoperable. And so so yeah, here we are. Uh, Material Digital pretty much uh, captures it, although very blatantly. Um, this is about digital twins in the end. Digital twins is a digital engineering term. It comes a little bit from the computer side. And also I am not uh, native to this habitat. I'm a computing science guy. Uh, and all the uh, uh, material science engineering experts around me are uh, teaching me a lot. So, so a lot of what you're doing here is knowledge transfer. So we'll come to that. But now to the to the projects I'm, I'm supposed to uh, to highlight. So there is the platform material digital. It's a, a platform is a overloaded term in this thing, but it's it's a good way to do this. Uh, but uh, for some logistics here, it's a, a project funded by the German government, and and that means that we have funding for uh, three years. We started in uh, 2019. Uh, so our first period ends next year, and we are we are definitely going to to the second phase of this. So so expect us to be there for a while. And and also there are some tricks and treats connected with it. Sorry for the pun. Halloween was just around the corner. And uh, but we will we will um, we will talk about that also. So but the project itself is trying to um, unearth all the uh, uh, things that matter about materials, like the things you write into literally analog notebooks made of paper and that are stashed sometimes in your desk for ages then. Uh, we want to, of course, open that up and make that available. And so uh, uh, doing that, uh, you can, everybody is trying to do that effectively. So that's a buzzword thing um, on, on the one hand. On the other hand, we see other projects out there that already tried that and they ceased to do things 10 years ago or something, I don't know. And that's a little bit scary when you think, huh, I'm trying to do the exact same thing. Why should I fare another fate? So, so our new, um, let's call it relatively cool, but also very obvious add-on, we're doing this with the community of partners. And uh, we, are, we are trying to establish a common uh, requirement, a common desire uh, to do this and we uh, process as a core project have a lot of other projects that, that do the actual materials like the the, the glasses the the concretes the, the the alloys and various compositions and and we heard about the material uh, uh, vocabulary and, and i think that's an excellent connection point already but all of this is kind of a little bit heterogeneous so to 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 glue all of this together we are using uh the, the formal thing that was called ontology. So ontologies, and I know NIST a little bit, to some is a little bit of a burnt term. So there were some not so 
good experiences with that. And, and so, so we, of course, don't say ontologies without saying the same sense curation process. So there's some guidance there. There's really some guidance. We have uh, connections to a lot of people who are like, they call themselves taxonomists. Taxonomists are not subclasses only, but they have this broader, narrower concept. Also, they are all about thesauruses, thesauri, effectively. Sorry. So, so, so it's writing down what is creating all these base things and not talking about ontologies first. So that's what we do. And then you know, to do that effectively, we, we also provide another building block set to our community of partners, and that's guidance documents, how to implement data conveyance. That might sound easy because, yeah, of course, I'll do Sparkle, you talk in ontology, so Sparkle it is. But um, then again, you have this data that you don't really want to share. And there's this open access data that's easy to share and some gray spectrum in between. And so now, now you, are, you, are, you, are, you have to create these safe spaces, you know, like, like people build buildings and live in them in order to share data in the same wired network. But well, we are now in this millennium, so maybe we can, we can be better. Maybe we can provide a, a mesh of platforms. And that's, again, a platform is not only a community, but literally a service mesh uh, where you can discover data, where you can find data, easy participate, and even have some guarantees, maybe some contracts, either software contracts or like the real legalese contracts in there. And then we have are talking about uh, uh, Jupyter notebooks already. Yeah. Exactly. So we have that as an example. It's literally on the slide. Um, so we have a few few workflow tools that we that, that process data, but they're not just creating some arbitrary data and consuming that in a proprietary way. No, they want to use the 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 the, the well understood fair one, and that is again using the the knowledge graphs that are based on this common vocabulary in the ontologies. And then, of course, you have the problem that you have machine parks. And these machine parks literally produce arbitrary data all over the world, billions of terabytes of data. And now you have to acquire them and mold them into the things that will fuel your, your data pools. And that's a hard process that you really have to, that's IoT, that's ICS, that, that's, I, in Germany it's called Industry 4.0, it's, I don't know how relevant that is, but uh, for all of that is now converging. So now we are going onto the format level for intermediate formats, not the ontology already, but how to convey data. And this is the challenge. So, so you need to have to transfer a lot of stuff. You have to transfer knowledge from books, like, uh, I don't know, the apple falls down, you, you know, there are some fundamental rules to the world and you want to also represent them in your knowledge, not only the process knowledge, the object is of iron and some copper, and maybe some charcoal in there, but no, it's, it's more than that, there's, there's universal, there's some universal knowledge, how things behave, how grain sizes influences tensile strengths, how, how the, the, the reflection of surface of a glass uh, is relevant for, for refactoring and if you build, I don't know, big telescopes and such. So, so this is universal already there. We have to also represent that in order to create new materials and new solutions. And the knowledge transfer for that is the definition of the vocabulary, but also it has to be sustainable. And that's a problem where everybody is like a little bit lacking. And this lack we try to also compensate by doing good guidances on knowledge transfer so so that there's a real benefit of doing this so i'm already a minute over so i will just say uh we have future targets and these future targets are uh, how is interoperable are we today we have to find that out with more partners who do for example object description the materials again pointing to the pi iron reference before pointing to the materials vocabulary before that sounds like excellent uh, connection uh, interfaces. And also we want to test our intermediate data model. We have something we can move around in binary and human readable. And that is not yet ontology. It's not the horrible stuff that comes out of the machine today. And it's, it's, it's a nice intermediate and we want to more get more feedback on that. And now this is me trying to squeeze all this in five minutes. Thank you for your attention. Sven. That was impressive. <laughs> so thanks very much. And so I'm going to add a quick comment here. And then, of course, we can discuss more later, which is, although Lauren and I are nominally the chairs of the panel discussion, it's going to get eaten up mostly by the presentations. And that's fine, um, because really the conversation is all of a single piece, uh, which is how do we get to substantive collaborations, you know, whether we think high level or the brass tacks of you know, what, what actual activities we want. So I think you've gotten the ball rolling there. So why don't we move to the next uh, presentation, which is uh, Masahiko Tamura from NIMS. Um, and so take it away if you're able to share slides.
So uh, hello or good morning and good, uh, good evening anyhow. So uh, I'm Masahiko Demura uh, at NUMUS, National Institute for Material Science. And I think I'm a uh, newcomer here. So uh, nice to meet all of you. And also I, I know Jim well, and then we, meet, we met each other maybe two days ago last or week yeah <laughs> it was friday <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow okay so uh should i need to share my slide that would or... be great okay yes so uh this is the slide you can see it i hope that this is a slide mode okay mm -hmm. so uh, again so i'm a director uh, of the research and services division of materials data and integrated system we call MADIS here. And here I introduced two projects relating to the data things. And left one, materials data platform project is a national project founded by a MEXT in Japanese government. And here uh, we would like to uh, develop the uh, technologies for collecting the data uh, of two ways. One is from a public articles. Uh, maybe some of them uh, knows that uh, the NIMUS hosting the uh, very large sized materials database named the Matnabi. And, uh, but we met a very serious, we meet a very serious problem to continue these kind of materials data curations for this uh, materials data. So we would like to accelerate uh, the materials curations for making the database much more by assisted, assisting uh, by the AI uh, natural languages uh, technologies. This is one way. And another way to collect the data is, uh, this is a quite new challenge for us is to transfer the experimental data from the equipment automatically using an uh, uh, Internet of Things devices uh, connected to the, uh, attached to the equipment. And also we developed the software to translate the output file from equip equipment, uh, which is a, uh, mm, Maybe we can say that uh, this is a uh, stru structurizing data uh, for reuse uh, for ourselves and also other uh, researchers. And after collecting the data, uh, we have the uh, very large capacity server, uh, which is uh, on-premise uh, servers. And on this server, we integrate the uh, system to handle the data consistently. And of course, we can feed the uh, functions to uh, deep searching through the Matnavi or the data coming from the uh, individual instrument. So anyhow, um, we think we have uh, our own data strategies uh, built on the fact that we are the materials science uh, materials research institute where we create the materials data daily so we would like to collect this data efficiently and also we would like to reuse these data even after finishing their uh, first purposes is finished but still we believe that there is uh, the data can be keeping their uh, values for re reusing. So uh, this is the materials data platform project. And the right one is a kind of the application side of the data uh, specified for structural materials. So we raise a concept named the materials integrations, which is maybe comparable to the uh, concept of a integrated Computational Materials Engineering, ICME. Here, we, I develop, we develop a specific, a very, uh, our own systems in which you can implement modules 
and then connect the module uh, by connecting the modules, you can make the workflow for uh, calculations. And making such a workflows, you can uh, do in you can link computationally among processing, structure, property, and performances, which are very important or fundamental elements in materials engineering. And also we use an, uh, uh, data scientific approaches to integrate experimental data and database and then computations. So the challenges in a project is uh, tools. One is, uh, uh, I can't hear my slide well, but, okay, sorry. So uh, one is a uh, collect materials data um, in a form uh, that is uh, helpful for reusing. So um, I think we can share applications uh, translating instrument output files. Uh, I put the name MDAC, which is uh, now openly open and you can use, you can download and you can use this software. Uh, we now just have done uh, two or three kinds of uh, um, applications uh, like uh, for XPS instrument or XLD instrument. So, but anyhow, uh, by using these applications, you can uh, structuralize the binary data outputted from the instrument. So uh, machine readable also, and also a human readable. And another challenge is to design a data structure for each material problems. And I believe that uh, it is very difficult to form the uh, common data structure for uh, any uh, types of materials problems. Instead, we should make a uh, data structure for each material pro problems. So in this materials integration problems for uh, specifying the structural material things, we are developing the ontology and also a data structure to treat the um, steels, for example, or uh, structural use. And so uh, now we have almost finished the design of the data structure. And then uh, now we are preparing the papers to describe the data structure we designed, uh, which include the uh, spreadsheet format and also XML schemas. And so uh, I, I am very happy if you use these kind of uh, data structures uh, for your uh, digitizations in each institute. So I think uh, it is also the point we can share the design data structure. So many cases, uh, for many cases, it is actually very difficult to share the data itself, but I think it is possible to share data structure or data schemas. Of course, I know that the NIST has a very uh, big effort to do that. And so I, we would like to join this effort and then to uh, accumulate the data structures. Uh, and so uh, maybe the ontology is helping to connect between these uh, data structures. And then once we have such an accumulated uh, data structures. And so uh, we can have a vision that the uh, data submissions according to a specific data schemas. So we don't need to, uh, how can I say, uh, do, uh, takes a lot of time to extract the data from the paper, for example, for these cases. So uh, reusable is, will be uh, accelerating. So, uh, okay, so this is my um, uh, uh, the things we, I can share. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. So there's obviously a lot there already that we're seeing in terms of overlap. 
So with that, uh, let's see who is next. My little notes here, unless Laura can tell me immediately. That, 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 that. David. Oh, David. It's, it's Dr. Albert. I'm all that's left. It must be me, Jim. No, <laughs> no we have one more after, no, one more. after you, fine. David, too. Um, so I am going to share a screen and hopefully that works. Thank you. I'm going to get all the little faces of people out of my way so I can see my own screen. <laughs> so um, I'm David Elbert. I'm here from Johns Hopkins. So thanks for letting me be part of this. This is really exciting already, things we've heard. So I'm a, a research scientist here at Hopkins, and I'm also sort of the materials data guy. Um, and I work on a number of projects. And although uh, Laura and Jim asked to talk about one project, there's a through going thread. So I'm going to allude to three of them. Uh, the first is what's called a MIP, a materials uh, innovation platform, which is uh, in this case named the Platform for the Accelerated Realization Analysis and Discovery of um, Interface Materials. I'm going to get a pointer here so I can wave at things. Um, and this is a joint effort here at Johns Hopkins and also at Cornell University um, with a number of different PIs. And Paradigm is, um, it's more than a user facility. It has a bulk crystal growth facility, electron microscopy facilities, uh, theory and simulations arm, and a thin film growth facility. Um, and down in the lower left of the slide, I sort of allude to some of those pieces. Um, and in the back of the slide is a uh, laser diode floating zone optical furnace um, doing a synthesis and actually a place where we've done some uh, machine learning and uh, to aid that process. Um, but really the idea of this is that it's more than a user facility, it's a platform. I think it was Hank who already used the word and said it's a bit overused, which uh, I can certainly agree to in some sense. But by that, what we mean is that it emphasizes knowledge sharing by connecting the facilities and the users, um, both internal and external users, the staff experts, and then connecting them through the data and uh, the know-how. So we go from an investigator's idea to actually being able to make something, to realize a novel material, characterize it, understand it, and then iterate that material's design loop. So it's supposed to be synergistic in that sense. And we've worked hard on using data to drive that. And so among the things we've done is build a streaming data infrastructure to capture a lot of that, a lot of that data. One thing that is clear from RDA events and other events is that um, removing that burden from users is really important here. And so uh, obviously people are developing tools to make that happen. By streaming the data, we're able to automate some aspects of curation. We have a data model as well. Um, so we're aware of uh, some of the things Masahiko's group has already been doing at, at NIMS with MDOC and the like. Um, we built our own data model and then integrated that with ideas from Citrine Informatics so we love to interop, interoperate on data models. We don't have to all use the same data model, but we certainly want ones that are translatable so we can understand and use other schemas. And then from that work, um, I'm also involved in a couple of um, DIMREF projects, also NSF funded projects. Um, and uh, number two, there's a picture up at the top right um, is a data-driven integration of experiments and multi-scale modeling for accelerated development of aluminum alloys. Um, with a group here at Johns Hopkins. And here, what we really did is something that I, I find interesting and important when working on the science side of my life, which is we inverted the process. Instead of thinking of the design loop as lots of tasks and then each working on their own data, we, we designed the whole process around an open data later layer in the center, which again is a streaming data layer. Uh, we emphasize Apache Kafka here for our streaming. So I really see lots of opportunity to interoperate between the IoT type of um, approach that's been taken in Japan and this Kafka approach. And we can talk about that more in discussion. But what we really do here is we have PIs and student groups, uh, groups that are working on processing, on characterization, and uh, the data is passed automatically. So we're automating these processes. There's an example of that down here in number two down below. This is a laser shock characterization. This particular project is built around um, increasing spall resistance in aluminum alloys. And so the laser shock experiment actually uh, ablates a, 
a piece of epoxy, which creates a plasma, which drives a microflyer into a sample at very high speed. And then it's instrumented with uh, uh, photon Doppler velocimetry. Um, and then we can, in the same data stream, automate analysis of the PDV data, spit that back for descriptors into computational models. We're not very far around the loop yet, but we're building that infrastructure. And then we've gone one step further in number three, another DIMREF in a totally different type of material setting, um, which is just getting started. It actually starts December 1st, officially is our start date. We have a kickoff meeting this, this week, which is to um, uh, automate data layer into data services to close the design loop for making um, higher quality recycled uh, plastics and actually instrument right through to the industrial um, extruders. So it's kind of exciting to me that we can go from the very basic science and 2D materials to more mechanical property uh, modeling and design, and then into something that can translate into the industrial setting. Uh, we have a lot of challenges. I'll quickly say that right now, the one that really flummoxes us is that in the research setting like this, um, the research com com is always evolving. People, some machines are pretty simple and XRD people go in and characterize, but in this laser um, shock lab, things are changing on the optical table. Ch things are changing in the stack that makes these flyers and students go in and do that work every week. And that shifts data types and services that are needed. And so really integrating the data team is something that's difficult um, and knowing how to get those tasks that they update. A nice thing about our streaming infrastructure is that it's loosely coupled so we can do that work without affecting anything else, just like an IoT would, um, but it's difficult to make that shift in how it develops. We have lots of interoperability issues, metadata extraction, we automate that to take that away. Uh, one thing about our streaming infrastructure is we can deploy our ML directly in the same infrastructure um, to go back and then control processes like high throughput processes in the lab. But we find that ML annotation is not very standardized. And so people grab data and then they have to re-annotate or label the data. That's pretty wa wasteful. And um, there's no standardization that I've seen yet on process control. And if we wanna translate these things to industry, uh, I think that's really gonna be an important thing. So in summary, I think we're really just at this exciting point in time and I'm way over, so I will stop and not describe that point in time anymore. Thanks. All right, thanks, Dave. So that was three, you know, fairly intense efforts on well, data infrastructure and, and, and integration. And you didn't even talk about the MARTA, so. <laughs> exactly. I don't yeah, always I talk about the MARTA, Jim, but I can. Yeah, I know. I, I was a little disappointed, though. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So we'll. I went uh, into the lab. So. Yeah. Okay. That's that's good. Okay. So it's just everyone remember the MARTA exists too, and Dave can answer questions about it. And so finally, uh, our last speaker is uh, Matthew Evans. Um, so go ahead. Uh, quick overview of Optimate, and then. Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Great. Yeah, so, so from three sort of very intense data management uh, infrastructure and, and projects, I'll give you one more laid back approach, uh, which is the, the Optimate Consortium. Um, and I guess if I could be a bit egotistical for a few minutes and just introduce myself and how I sort of differ maybe from the other speakers. Uh, so I am very much a, well, I'll say very much, I'm an academic, I'm a, a postdoc. Um, I am not paid at all to do anything to do with data, fair data preservation or anything like this. Uh, so the incentives I have are still essentially publishing papers. Uh, to, to sort of keep my job. Um, and that's primarily at the moment at, at UC Levan uh, in, in Belgium. Uh, but also at the same time, I, I've managed to get a, a sort of scrape a tiny bit of funding at, at my uh, sort of PhD institution at Cambridge uh, to work with experimentalists on creating some tools for them to actually just manage the data in their group. And I, yeah, I very much uh, share the same fears as Henk, uh, although with significantly less funding, that we will come along and try and, and do the same thing that everyone else has been trying for 10 years uh, and, and fail in, in creating a sort of uh, a digital infrastructure that works for them. Uh, so that's where I'll sort of be coming from in the panel discussion. Uh, but to give you a quick uh, quick overview of Optimade, uh, I know many of you in, well, I recognize many of the names in the chat, so uh, I'll try and keep it brief and, and, and sort of contrast it to what I've spoken about in the past. Uh, so one, one new thing, if, if you want to sort of skip this talk, is that we haven't actually have a paper out now uh, in, in scientific data. Uh, so I'll, I'll linger on that for a second. Um, but you can obviously just Google uh, Optimade, uh, go to optimade.org and see all the links. So what actually is Optimade? Well, uh, we are a consortium of about, uh, well, 60 or so people uh, who came together in, in 2016 
uh, and sort of just sat down and decided to make materials databases interoperable or in interoperable and interoperational um, by developing a common REST API. Uh, and now these, when I say materials databases here, I, I, it's a much narrower view to what we've heard about already. Uh, this is primarily just uh, crystal structures uh, that you would use as input for a, a, you know, a DFT calculation, say. Um, but also a few experimental databases of crystal structures uh, got involved. So we had five annual meetings, uh, say since 2016, uh, nearly 60 authors. And what came out of it was this sort of 20,000 word human readable specification. Uh, and it, you know, it really did sort of take that long to, to agree on things, agree on the definitions, agree on the technology we were going to use, agree on what things were mandatory. Uh, so you know, in some way, you could think of this as a, a domain specific, um, probably more of a taxonomy rather than a, a, a schema. Um, but then we actually sort of our, have actualized that and have this sort of federated list of providers. So 15, uh, probably even more than that now, actually probably 16 or 17 registered data providers who are hosting data in the format we came up with. Uh, as an open JSON API. Um, I will hopefully <laughs> skip through this animation as quickly as I can. We're distributed across the world. Uh, many of the databases you probably will have heard of. So the materials project, Aflow and OQMD from the, from the US uh, are three big ones. Uh, some bigger also EU initiatives. So uh, Nomad, uh, the materials cloud in Switzerland and the COD uh, are the sort of uh, the big players there. And we also have quite a lot of data now already. So this is taken from our paper. Uh, each column here shows the number of results for a different query in Optimate, where the query is something like, um, give me every crystal structure that contains a group five elements. This one is something like, give me every structure that contains a group five element, but not lead that has three elements in it or something like that. Um, but as you can see, you know, there are, these numbers are quite large. We probably have about uh, 25 million or so crystal structures, I think by now uh, available in this format. Uh, and that's evidenced as well by just the number of authors we had on our paper. Uh, so as I say, it's quite a, a large collaboration uh, in, in our field. Uh, I'm aware I'm running out of time already, so I will just very quickly uh, skip through this. Um, you know, in terms of what actually is Optimade, we, we wrote something based on JSON API. We produce Open API three schemas, um, but essentially, it's a, it's a you know it's, a, it's an API format that everyone has to obey if they are serving Optimade data. Uh, and we have lots of tools for validation and, and sort of associated software to make that an easy process. So again, one way that sort of we differ from, or that I differ, I guess, from, from some of the projects we've heard about so far uh, is that the sort of the, the individual unit of, of data that we care about, um, you know, it could be just some structures from a paper or it could be an entire database. Uh, we're not talking about sort of facility level or, or anything like that. Uh, features are probably less important for this introduction. Uh, here's some of the software we wrote. So there's Optimate Python tools package uh, as well. We also had a, a paper on this fairly recently in, in JOS. Um, and the idea here was that, you know, the people we're targeting, they don't have time to, if they've got a database, they don't have time to go away and implement another API. So we'll, we'll do that for them. We'll kind of take that burden on and, and distribute it across, the, across our community as much as we can. Um, and that provides this sort of reference server implementation. Uh, so if people are already using MongoDB or Elasticsearch, which were two of the most popular backends, uh, it should be, I say no code, that's very, those commas are very inverted, um, but it's, it should be easier at least. Um, and in fact, so the, what, the one success story we had is that someone just made an Optimate API and registered as a provider without any of us knowing who they were, what was going on, and suddenly there were another 100,000 structures, uh, again, for a, a case we hadn't thought of, so for 2D materials specifically, uh, that used our code. So that was, that was one success since uh, the last RDA. So it's used by Materials Project Nomad. This is the new one, 2D Mappedia, and also Materials Cloud. So it's fairly well supported uh, by the projects that actually have funding to do this. Okay, let's skip through some of this. Uh, there's some links to the providers if you want. I say everything's on our homepage anyway. And in terms of what's next, uh, just to sort of tie it into our discussion later. So we're interested in how we can disseminate properties in each of these individual databases. Uh, lots of them have additional data that we don't currently standardize. And you know, the only way we can really do this is by providing a way for them to describe what they have. Uh, we have our own sort of bespoke info endpoints for this, but ultimately we're going to be moving towards ontologies as well. Um, and we have lots of links with the, the EMMO already. And in fact, there's this materials design ontology developed by some of our collaborators. Uh, but we'll probably keep it in this kind of optimated format where we can also have these federated ontologies 
uh, all, all again open source on GitHub that people can conversion or you know mint new versions of and make pull requests against things like that. Uh, and of course, we'll be extending uh, the tools we already have. But then the final point I made is, is money. So we do have one CCAM funded postdoc right now, which is which is great, and they have been very supportive in terms of workshops. Um, We've been running quite a few tutorials, so one under the auspices of Nomad, and we've got one coming up uh, through this uh, East African Institute for Fundamental Research and some joint funding with UNESCO and the uh, Abdusalam Center for Theoretical Physics, which is really good. But ultimately, no, none of those authors, apart from, well, uh, the, the new postdoc isn't on that author list, but none of those authors were at all funded to do any of this, and that's not sustainable. But the, the only way this is carrying on now is that it's all open source and people are just picking it up and, and volunteering and so on. So that's sustainability is, is, is key for these kind of bottom up projects, as I think you know, Henk has already mentioned. And it would be great to see how some of the, uh, the more sort of top down, well funded projects could, could help support us uh, in terms of software. And uh, you know, I, I guess hosting as well would be fantastic. So I've, I've almost certainly gone over. I, mean, I, I didn't get the memo about two slides, my afraid. So I, I had to just sort of scrape up an old presentation here. Um, but here are some pictures of people at workshops when it was nice outside. Um, and there's the ultimate author list. So looking forward to the discussion. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so we did include you even though we knew that the funding was not where you want it to be. Of course, that's true for everybody in some sense. <laughs> um, nonetheless, uh, you've made a, the groups have made a tremendous amount of progress because I think the incentives were pretty clear there. Um, they're clear for all of them, I should say, but I guess the problem was also in some sense more tractable. Um, so it's nice to see that it was. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, should, I should just say we never actually applied for any funding either. So that's, <laughs> there you go. That's, you know, that that's, might be the next thing we do. <laughs> the old rule, you don't get what you don't ask for, right? <laughs> um, okay, so we're, you know, we are running out of time now. So what I would suggest um, is that I hand over the panel discussion to the other two moderators, um, but that we also open the floor up for questions as I do that. Um, and then uh, we start the discussion on, you know, the, just exactly how we could collaborate. Uh, you know, there's a lot of potential ideas here that I've seen. So, uh, that would be my proposal for how we go forward. And then we'll try to stop firmly uh, the discussion at say 20 after, we'll get it a few minutes there. Um, and then we'll try to figure out what our next steps are. Does that seem reasonable, Laura? That sounds great, Jim. And also I'm going to put in the chat, I'm repeating um, Andrea's message earlier to remind people, um, please go to the collective notes um, come, uh, and under the agenda is a sign in sheet and we ask that people um, indicate that they're attending this session. And, and we could use that document too as a way for people to write down some ideas along the collaboration lines, although. You know, yes, and that's underneath the sign in is great. space for that as well too. Um, and so I think then Birgit and Bjorn are taking over on panel two discussion. Yes, thank you, <clears throat> Laura. Um, then I su suggested we proceed with um, Hank's second slide and I try to share it again. Are we doing the, uh, the challenges now? So the yes. technical issues, ah, okay. So I thought there would be uh, some uh, Okay. Yeah, maybe I can mold all of this. So I have five minutes for this uh, again. Yes, please. Or, 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 yes. yes, please. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let me but reset we my are very, We are very liberal with time. So yeah. five plus. Five plus. So, I'm, 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 so I'm, I, will, I will try to weave some threads here. Um, A part of the problem that everybody needs to make people like this <laughs> and make people liking this is means that like there is an incentive here to for, for, for participate participation like, like to, to join in the effort to to, to see value here um, and then there are um, I think um, um, core issues 
that we can carry that here. So this this typical this is the slide is on uh, the, the, the it says two top technical issues, and I think solving some of these independent of that we want to create so to speak a better world where everything is better understood and where data is uh, easier to understand and also easier to publish which is i guess a golden grail for uh, the, the academics so like like having this this reference data that you worked on for years and now you can reference it in a way that really is understood by the whole community automatically that the jupyter networks can now dive on this and consume it and use it as the reference uh, data that you really envision that's nice i think that is absolutely a goal to aspire to then again you have to create that and to create that there's a lot of i want to call it pain right now um you have to go through it jumps with some hoops and one of these hoops is my first technical issue here on this slide so um you are you are dealing with humans, of course. Humans have you are, humans are smart, and uh, humans humans drive all this, and and therefore in the end uh, the output of human work has to uh, be incorporated here, yeah, naturally, and then humans operate things um, like I don't know in a machine park you have in a supply chain of manufacture a lot of uh, stations. And these, these, uh, that, that's a logistical problem. So, so everything you do, if it is an experiment, if it is a uh, um, analysis process where you where you, you would extract specimens out of the production line, or maybe from an experiment creating it just for the analysis process, um, you 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 kind of split out or deliberately create stuff for that, and that is again different from simulation, where you. Where you think of uh, how a process step looks like, you you scale down you to your specific I don't know mesoscale or nanoscale, and then you do simulation of how proteins force themselves into uh, sorry water forces themselves into proteins and make them break and then fold, and that's the problem for some medicine that you want to process for example. So there's a lot of things here that is data. It's from humans. It's from machines. And some arbitrary use, uh, well, well, universal knowledge. You 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 know because it's 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 defined. That your universal laws uh, that that have been written down for ages, and there are references to to metallography or to references to to other test methods and such. So all these things you want to now acquire, and you want to model them to be fair. A book in a shelf is not fair. Unfortunately, from our way, it is not digitally fair, you know. And so, so the the first challenge I want to talk about is how to come from the data source, and the data source can be a machine in a machine park. It can be the very distinct process node that is an experiment in the physical world, and it can be a set of simulation uh, Jupyter notebooks that that consumes data and produces data for you. And uh, now you want to have from from these various domains. These are, I'm calling these data sources right now for simplicity. Um, you want to unify that. So in the end, why would you want to do that? Of course, it's, it's less money for integration. So so the, the interface uh, uh, adoption is, is, is small, and that, that that is of course a money saver, of course. But uh, uh, in the end, it also uh, creates a common understanding. So so the problem here is. That you, when you have arbitrary data at, at some beginning, again, a lot of sources, as I told you that, and, and you, you go to the, for example, in our case, the ontology, that's a big leap. That is really a big leap. Also, it involves a lot of people, like the people that are very familiar to the process or the thing you're doing, and the people that are very familiar to data. And the IT and clouds and and privacy and and and, and principles for, for for security measures, right? So 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 then these have to get to some to do. They have to do some knowledge transfer, of course, and that is necessary. But can they do that all the time? Maybe not. 
maybe maybe there is that we have to disentangle the dependency of all these people have to talking each other that maybe, maybe there's one part of this that creates well-formed data to some extent and then go from there and then this keep this to the it guys i'm, I'm really breaking this down of course on semantic webs uh, people and, and ontologists and iot people are not just the it guys but again to, to forcing them to be in the same room for eternity and talking with them like on a weekly basis, that might not be feasible. So, so that that's that's why we have a pipeline from data source to the graph model information that is being the again we are using ontologies, but you can do something similar, um, like a Lego graph database or something like that. And um, now you want to understand how it really is useful to get a breaking point here, an intermediate point. Where you where you can enhance the machines to produce better data to help here, and keywords here are self-descriptive data and and semantic data that is already somehow uh, support in support of FASTA principles, and then the actual uh, I think old school work that is modeling the knowledge graph and making this accessible. So that's that's really a challenge today, and and so my early industry feedback is yeah that is a okay. Let's go with that, but we don't know. So we assume it's it's a it's a founded thesis, and I think early feedback shows, yeah, this is the right way to go. But we need other people engaged. And I think this is a good place to 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 basically speak that out. Let's join. Let's do off breakout sessions, uh, interims until the next plenary, and talk about this. Do we have the same problems? I don't know. I think that's really interesting technical issue to talk about how the perception of the problem looks like and how actually measures would look like to address and, and mediate some of these problems so i've been talking way too much on this already so the other one the other one i've been so we have a leniency here uh, so the other thing is um my data is my data and my data is very important to me. I want to share this based on contracts and legal and, and, and ironclad like, contracts. Like if you do this, uh, basically I don't have to work anymore because the, 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 the uh, legal fees would be like, uh, the reimbursement would be like uh, enormous. That is an interesting scenario. Um, yet nevertheless, we don't want to create silos. As silos, I mean, are they perceived as negative because you're dumping everything in something and, and that is like out of control. And now you want to decentralize this. I heard the term federation before, and I think that's great as an idea. But how do you actually do that? How do you find something in a remote, let's call it micro silo, yeah? that's your cool data, without talking about it? So there's a conundrum here. So that doesn't work. So discovery requires central infrastructure, always. Tell me something else, I will argue you're wrong and we have an interesting academic discussion on this. But in the end, you have to discover data in order to work with data. But if the data is confidential, that's the issue. That is a real technical issue. What can you expose in order to make discovery useful? How may you discover things in a federation? And then I heard uh, Kafka before. I, 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 hope, I, I hope it's the Kafka that I know. My Kafka that I know is a broker system for telemetry on topics that is a pub subscribe system with a very poor broker model. And I hope it's that because, yeah, putting something into a Kafka um, broker domain, for example, could be one solution to the problem. And I want to hear more about this because the, the work people I'm working with right now, they are all about um, data um, resource repositories. But you register data there and you go there, and you get pull and pull, and nothing is telemetry, nothing is uh, streamed. So, so maybe, maybe that's not the best way to do it. So I think that's an interesting idea how to decentralize information, how to talk about it, and then how to communicate updates. Which, for example, a pub sub model with a broker in between, like Kafka has, would be an interesting idea. So, uh, yeah, I think these are actually two topics that I really, really want more in input on. And we are open for this. So, there's an email on some Google Doc thing right now. Email me. And otherwise, let's do interims and talk about this and maybe create an agenda that could, I don't know, do a subset of these problems and we talk about that. Thank you. Thank you, Hank for this presentation and for the stimulation of the discussion, I assume, later. Um, then I think the second, present, um, the second person will be Masahiro Demura. You have a second slide as well, right?
you're still muted. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Okay, okay. so let me start. So I have already uh, uh, given two points we can share. And here I would like to deep inside in more details. Uh, one is to collect the translation apps for instrument in uh, these apps trans translate the in instrument output into machine readable and human readable forms. Uh, actually, we have already released uh, the application apps named MDAC for XPS in instrument, also XLD instrument. And of course, we would like to extend the uh, different kinds of uh, many kinds of instrument. Uh, uh, so I would like to propose that uh, if you can join to support for support us to extend the uh, target instrument, uh, we are very happy uh, to negotiate with the instrument company. Uh, that so uh, so many numbers of uh, users uh, would like to um, make such a uh, translation apps, and of course now we have a budget to support or a budget to develop such a uh, translation app. So I think uh, it's a it would be a good idea for sharing. Uh, the uh, the translation apps. So uh, this is one uh, technical issue we can tackle together. And next is maybe relating to the topics by Hank, uh, which is uh, to share the well-defined data schema. So this is an example of a designed data structures in uh, in our materials integration project which is specified for steels structural materials so as demonstrated here is so uh, we should take care about the uh, differences is welding order or unit collections items or etc so uh, I have we did a lot of works to standardize these uh, data structures and also we uh, prepared this Excel XML schemas, uh, which is more readable, machine readable format, I think. And uh, so these uh, data structure itself can be open for public. So I think uh, now we are preparing the paper to explaining the how to design or how, what, what is the uh, that structure uh, features of data structures uh, we design in uh, in in some uh, journals maybe so uh, one possible uh, proposal here is to um, collect or uh, the increase the number of a data schema so uh, once we collect, accumulate the data schemas, we can move to the uh, next stages where uh, uh, some expert um, curate the data schema. I mean, the collect the data schema and organize the data schema. And of course, uh, they can connect or they can make a network between the different data schemas. And also, I'd like to emphasize that the data schema itself is cannot be freezed. They should be modified. Uh, so, I mean, uh, once you freeze the data structures, which means that the uh, you stop the progress of science, right? So uh, the progress of science in, uh, introduce a new vocabulary or a new concept and so we should modify the data structures. So uh, uh, I think uh, in uh, futures, it is ideal to form an international committee of experts 
to uh, curate data schemas. But for going to these steps, as in a, a very fast step, is just to collect the data schemas. So this is my uh, proposal uh, or relating to the uh, two top technical issues we can, we might tackle together. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Yeah, you, I think you addressed some very important points. Also that those documents are living documents and have to be further developed. I think it's a very important thing from my point of view as well. So I'm not sure, David, do you also have a second slide? Yes. Okay, yes, then do. please pre present it to us. Bring that up. Okay. So uh, again, it's great going after a couple of other people who have hit on things that are already exciting to me. We didn't pre-coordinate any of this, so I was quite worried about it. But Hank talked about graph model data um, and about streaming. Uh, and Masahiko talked about um, uh, sharing that um, interoperability. And those are all really critical things. So one thing that we have bumped up against, I guess I'll get just a little more specific perhaps than they did. Um, is uh, I think of it in the larger concept of preparing for some type of graph learning, representational learning, which I think will become a large um, research topic that will be very useful in the community. But no matter how you think of it, uh, I uh, we, we think a lot in terms of material science, one thing that makes us different is this idea of a material history. Um, and most of our data models revolve around uh, describing the actual material and most of our metadata schemas are things that describe the material in some way and then encode process along the way somewhere. Um, and I think that having some uh, concept of what we mean by the minimum viable material history, what needs to be there so that we can create this knowledge graph, this directed acyclic graph of how we got from something to something else. Um, uh, needs to go beyond that simple sample metadata at this point. And a particular technical issue that we run into is um, coordinating or encoding that graph uh, in some simple JSON. The way we do it right now in our data model is that uh, a JSON um, has uh, encoded descriptions of the digital objects and the objects have a pointer back from whence they came. So to build the entire material history, we can extract that information from any digital object in the JSON. But I think we can do a lot better if we actually develop together a format where we would encode the edges of the graph, not just the nodes on the graph within the JSON. There's a lovely library called NetworkX, uh, which would then let us do things with those graph represented JSONs. And uh, it's something that my group is just beginning to sort of engage at this point in time. I suspect others around the world have already engaged that problem. And I think it would be really great to make sure that we interoperate on um, just exactly how we encode that entire material history. So then we could also envision developing tools to visualize that material history, to access data at different points along the material history, or to learn across that whole history. So that's one challenge. I find that's a technical one that would be good to, to uh, work on, interoperate on the interoperation, if, if I may. Um, and then a second one that I'll just go in a little bit of a different direction. So at the bottom, there's a there's a little figure here where we have um, done some single crystal growth of boron carbides in our floating zone furnaces. Um, and we developed a learning stack for that that's openly available. I forgot to put the DOI, DOI here for that stack. Um, but what we did, of course, was we developed a, an annotated stack. Um, we had some students do some of that work. It's tedious, of course, to label data like that. Um, and then we uh, succeeded with a model that could bring feedback into the um, synthesis system, but we wanted to improve it. And one thing that I think the scientific community is, is uh, still a little slow on is that there's a lot of desire to now pick a new model. But in fact, the place we can make the biggest impact is to have a better data training set. And we need larger, better annotated sets. And the only practical way to do that is to aggregate labeled annotated sets of data for different types of problems. And to do that, what we have found is we need to coordinate that annotation because when one student leaves and another comes and wants to expand that data set, they've had to go back and relabel data that's already labeled. 
um, because uh, in a variety of different ways, there are subtleties to labeling data and decisions that have to be made. And we don't really have a model system for how we can share that. And um, this is a, um, a problem that we bump into a lot as we apply machine learning to the actual data sets. And I think the data community has to grab onto that um, and help us discover ways that we can um, enhance how we do that and really give us a, a framework to even think about what that would look like. I don't think it's a very well ex, um, understood part of what's sometimes called uh, ML ops now. So those are two community challenges in my view, which I think would be really useful to coordinate on. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, David. And um, Matthew, do you also have some thoughts to share about this topic? Yeah, I've shamelessly just made one, if that's okay. That um, is okay. Whilst, of course, listening carefully. Um, let me share my screen. Yeah, so I mean, I think I sort of droned on quite a lot about some of the challenges already that Optimator's faced. Um, so I thought I'd just sort of mention two here that seem to gel fairly well with uh, what's been discussed. Uh, and one is, uh, so how do we sell the kind of the, the kind of possible futures that are going to be enabled by, you know, the projects we're all working on? And it's, it's been a bit tricky for, for Optimate in particular, because the databases that we're sort of unifying in a sense are already really well used in the community. Uh, you know, everyone has their sort of favorite that they will go to, uh, and each has its own specific uh, sort of use cases. Um, it, it can be quite difficult to then motivate a science case that is sort of uniquely Optimate. Um, and part of that comes down to the fact that people are just going to use the data in lots of different ways. So uh, I'll touch on this in the second challenge, but you know, when most people query a material science database, at least in computational material science, um, often they're looking for all known stable materials that, that like mankind has possibly conceived, right? It, it's not, we're not looking on the level of samples or anything like that. We're, we're really looking at sort of creating data sets for materials discovery. So you know, people want to be able to suggest new compositions to look at, um, either computationally or experimentally. Um, and that, you know, that, that has challenges um, of how we sort of write an API specification to go along with that. Um, and how much of this long tail data are we, are we wasting? So I think it's the, the sort of the data, the data management side hasn't really kept up with the, uh, the scale of the computational power available in, in computational material science. So I think it's fairly routine now for, you know, uh, an individual publication may generate 100,000 crystal structures and then run calculations on them. You know, from, you know, for my PhD, I guess I probably generate about 500,000. And a lot of these, I think a lot of people just sort of, you know, they're just gone, they're thrown away um, because they weren't the, the actual useful endpoint. Um, so I think for, you know, in the context of machine learning as well, how, how do we, uh, how can we enable this sort of you know, big data within Optimate that also keeps the, uh, the sort of curated aspect of some of the other databases. So rather than just flooding our, our public API with, you know, my 500,000 garbage crystal structures I made during my PhD, like uh, how do we sort of add, it's gonna be the next challenge, but how, how do we add the kind of intention, um, the sort of, I think I call it semantic intention um, in, in the next step. And then a more sort of concrete thing is just, you know, what, what sort of software applications, you know, we've heard people talk about microservices a lot, but now we have a well-defined schema. It, it's easy to set up a server that says, I accept optimized structures. I will spit out an optimized structure. There's lots of cool things you can do with that already. Uh, sort of distributing some of the work around, uh, well, again, primarily around sort of materials design and materials discovery, where maybe you want a, uh, a whole range of defect structures based on one particular crystal structure. You want to be able to sort of fire that off and, and get a response from a server uh, that does that in the Optimate format, um, which I think would be a, a useful science case. But again, it, it, it's a bit hard to sell without it existing. So the second challenge, I, okay, so I didn't call it um, semantic intention, but this, you know, this, this sort of harder to capture level of semantic interoperability. So I've said federated intention, and by that I mean, you know, Optimate is a, a format, it's a transport format. It standardizes how you're allowed to filter on this data in a way that's useful for filtering on crystal structures. But as I said, it, it doesn't say anything about what those crystal structures mean, what processes they came from. And that's kind of up to each database to describe. And I don't sort of, you know, I, I think that the equivalent of like the processing history graph um, 
that I think a few speakers have already mentioned is quite technical for, for sort of computational material science and it's also very opaque. So if, if you're thinking about, you know, you just want to query equilibrium structures, if you had the full ontologized graph, uh, you know, you might be expecting someone to write like a, a Sparkle query that does, you know, give me every output structure that has an input uh, edge that's uh, that was a geometry optimization with this certain set of parameters, blah, 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 blah. Um, so then there may be some case for them standardizing things like these are equilibrium structures or, uh, you know, these, these materials are stable uh, in, to some degree. Um, and that can involve this kind of global lookup, right? So for, for a particular crystal structure in a database to be classed as stable, it has to be stable against all possible you know, decomposition routes. So you, you know, it could be a, a quite a large database query. And that, sort of, that kind of curation has to be done uh, by the database beforehand. And many aren't sort of capable of doing that just you know, as they add more data. So I think that's a, a challenge. And, and certainly it becomes harder when people have different intentions. Uh, which is the sort of the federated intention side. Uh, and then I think what this is my final point is, is then sort of how can we enable, uh, you know, sort of crosswalk to other projects whilst minimizing this kind of impedance mismatch with the databases we already have. Um, so, you know, how can we make the Optimate data uh, most useful in that sense? Because, you know, we're already getting sort of questions on our forums. Well, I say already, we had one today, which is why I've mentioned it. Uh, you know, sort of how do I query all data in all of Optimate so I can make a machine learning data set? And, you know, that's probably not, you know, I get what they want, but that's probably not a useful query. Uh, but how do we sort of convey that in, in within the specification itself? Um, so those are maybe a bit technical if you didn't sort of know about Optimate already, but I think those are my, my two challenges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. So at this point, I wanted to hand over to John, but I'm not quite sure how we proceed with the discussion now. Yeah, that's a good uh, question. <laughs> uh, maybe it's a question to Laura and, and Jim. How strict is is like the are the organizers here with keeping the time? So can so we? So we we it is rather strict. Um, I mean, we can. So look, I mean, what I would what the ultimate suggestion that we're going to come away with from this meeting is that we need to meet more. Yes. Okay. <laughs> right. In other words, because there's no way to do this in an hour and a half. I mean, I think there were a huge number of ideas that just came out. Fortunately, not well, there's a there is a number of very good ideas that, that came out. And I think there's a lot of overlap. So I think we need to have both. There was a discussion that back and forth I had with Zach about possibly setting up a standing meeting, you know, maybe monthly uh, for this group. But also then figuring out how to spin out, you know, more focused collaboration uh, uh, activities, as it were, uh, based on mutual interest. Uh, because I certainly heard, uh, oh, you know, in the case of the graph uh, representations of, you know, whether it's uh, uh, material histories or, or, or something else, uh, the types of ways we can integrate uh, the registry. Uh, uh, technologies, the question about schema sharing and metadata uh, architectures. There's a whole bunch of stuff uh, that I just heard. So I would, I'm trying to think about what we can do in the next seven minutes. Um, the first so, thing would be, go ahead. Yeah, I just, I had, I had the impression that maybe if we can take the time for that, wouldn't it be good to give the panelists the, 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 the um, option to react to each other? Kind of, because I think we have, if, if you're okay with that, because I think there's it's an interesting mixture of people and perspectives here. When I when I just look at what Hank told us as an issue, and when I look at, at Matthew's background, I see that Matthew comes from a community with people that are enthusiastic and in, in participating without being paid. And Hank pointed to the problem to involve people, to, 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 to show them the benefits. You know, that's two, opposites of the spectrum here i think and but i think it is very important to understand that that the, the group of people even in this so we can certainly here. do that in a few minutes so if they if you want to do that right the second i just want to make sure that we come back at least near the end and figure out i also want people to hit to take a take a look at the uh google doc um and make sure that they've written down their priorities for what they'd like to see us work on and that Laura and I will work on, uh, you know, organizing follow-up meetings. Okay, so I'll, we'll uh, 
we'll, and we'll of course uh, communicate with all all of the participants to make sure everybody's schedule can you know accommodate this. Um, all right. So if you uh, are there uh, additional comments as Bjorn just uh, suggested from the panelists themselves in reaction. So Jim, I mean one one reaction I have since I haven't said the word MARTA really yet, <laughs> for those who don't know, MARTA is the Materials Research Data Alliance, which is really made for more um, in the domain specific work and working groups that can meet on a more regular uh, basis. Zach already put um, a note in the doc I saw earlier about a, a working group that he co-chairs that does uh, hackathons and we'll be working on some pub sub stuff. Um, but I think that some of the things we are talking about interoperating on here it's really great for this group to bring people together especially internationally and start that work and then some of these things would be great to go into a marta working group right to get down and dirty and and figure out how can we actually um encode the material history in a different way in json and come up with some some practical things um work on uh what uh Masahiko has talked about, about uh, extractors, right? We're writing extractors from our stream data for metadata as well. And then I think there are, are you know, so we'd like to have those all interoperate and, and be able to give our extractors to them and use their extractors and not duplicate effort. Um, so those make nice working groups. But then I think there are some bigger topics here also that we have come up with that really belong at the data level that we get um, at an RDA that we're not going to get at MARTA about ontological representations and concepts of federation and things like that. So I, I don't know, as we as we build these things in the Google Doc, if um, there are ways that we can uh, uh, figure out where those dividing points are, it might be really helpful. I think that should be the goal of the Doc, right, is what are the topics? Some of them could be formalized, as it were, in MARTA. It's uh, you know, that's a great way to do it. Why not? Uh, it gives you some additional resource because Marta has a small amount of resource uh, to help support these things. Um, and as I said, the most important thing that we get out of this is a sense of common purpose to try to uh, tackle some of these issues uh, where we can help each other. Because uh, that's really the goal uh, is to, as you said, you know, not be duplicative and um, hank has his hand up oh he does that's very polite of him well <laughs> yeah because i, and I, I know Celisa also has her uh has her hand up so let's see if we can get her in before we run out of time <laughs> okay so who's next um first hank and then alicia thank you okay mm -hmm. so yeah i think we should uh, do one thing and not not do the other so we should paralyze here um so yes I think next meeting monthly is awesome. If everybody here could spare uh, two hours in a month, which is in December, so it's almost Christmas. We have some time there, you know, everybody knows that. So, uh, and, and then, and then um, the Google Doc. I think as a parallel endeavor to, to start that and just, I don't know, um, a guided uh, a structure like, uh, uh, please put your topics of discussion here um, and then people just write in there. And, and, and who, who, is never, who is not doing this is not doing that. But I think everybody here is like a little bit enthusiastic about finding other people who do the same thing. <laughs> I think that's cool. And then we have this, 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 this very orthogonal things like telemetry, how do we phrase records of history of artifacts i mean how this is this is this is a common thing in digital twins for example and then and, and, and how do we phrase them i think we have an idea but but I, i'm not sure if that's the best idea so so yeah i think these are topics we should um uh, accumulate in the doc and then a week before the next interim in a month uh the chairs could like okay this seems to be a common point of interest and then moderate the topic decision we have and then i would say two hours i know it's it's not just an hour, but you know how we are. We are talk, 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 and so hour is gone so fast. And there may be two hours, and then we go from there monthly. I really like that. And then we find out, and before P19, we have a better understanding who is where, who can contribute what, and who where are the interests. And then we identify one, two, three cool things and go with that. 
So I would really love to see that. That's I'm that's sure. great. And let's let move on. And thanks so much for that. And Alicia, uh, we've got like about a minute and Matthew will try and get you in, but let's let, let Alicia talk. Thanks. I just wanted to say that um, I found the data mining aspect of the NIMS project really interesting and something that um, is very different in terms of the challenges in different verticals, in terms of different domains of material science. And I think that in and of itself is a very interesting point of potential collaboration and commonality in terms of sharing um, challenges in access, um, challenges in the extraction process, changes, challenges in annotation, et cetera, across different verticals of, of, of domains. So I'd love to see that as a topic of interest. Um, it's very close to home at the moment for, for us. Good. No, there's a lot here. So this is the excitement. Um, and so I think with that comment and with the straw man strategy that Hank just uh, threw out, which I think is completely plausible. And if we'll see how it goes, right? We'll, we'll have a meeting in a month and, <laughs> and, then, we'll, we'll see, and then we'll see where we go from there. Um, uh, so Laura's. I am here and <laughs> I think we're out of time. Um, we will, uh, we, I ask all of the presenters to please send your slides. If you haven't, we will post the slides and we will also get back on next steps. Um, if you have additional comments, please add them in the collective notes. Thank you so much for taking part in this session. It was really great. All right, we'll get there. It's going to take just a little bit longer. All right. <laughs> all right. Thank you, organizers. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks Thank you all.